So today's topic is going to be uh, free speech and the dark side of free speech. And basically, this is going to be our first like applied ethics sort of class. And by applied ethics here, I mean a topic that has ethical implications, but is more focused than just what is right or where does goodness come from or is it relative? It's rather going to be looking at a particular topic that in today's day and age has an important role and has these ethical dilemmas around it. And that is going to be the topic of free speech. So these six questions are basically what we're going to cover in class today. And we're just going to look at what each of the answers to these questions are and talk about especially this sixth question of what actually is the dark side, how has it been made worse, and how do we have to reconceive of free speech given the nature of the internet. So that's generally going to be what we're discussing today. Um, I'm so tired of hearing my own voice, and I'm so exhausted, and I know we're on Zoom, but um, I'm going to require people to give me answers for these things, or we're going to have really awkward silences in which we all just stand here, um, or I guess sit there. Um, so, you're welcome. Yes, it can 100% be typed, Omar. I've got the chat open, so all of you, if you want to answer in the chat, that's fine. I just don't want to be giving you answers the whole time, so yes. Fire away on the chat. So first question, what is free speech? Yeah, the, the right to say what you like. What are some other definitions of it? And what does free speech apply to, I guess, is one thing. Because calling it free speech is a bit of a misnomer because it's more general than that. Oh, Omar, you cut in and out. Oh, uh, could it be also be like uh, when it's like in text or something? Exactly. It's not just speaking. It can also be written. It's also actions. So, for instance, the right to hold up a sign and protest. The right also included under free speech is freedom of religion generally falls under that. So yeah, if any sort of expression, the freedom to make art that criticizes people. So if you wanted to make your... Um, say you were taking an art class and you wanted to make your final project a uh, piece of art depicting, I don't know, how terrible I am as a human being because I talk about skinning babies so much, you could do that. That's freedom of speech, even if it's in like an artistic form. So yeah, it's just the right, and here's the key, it's a right. It's being allowed. And this notion of a right is something that you're allowed to do. It's something that you have permission for. So it is the right or the ability to say what is on your mind without repercussions. So that's the main idea of free speech. So does anyone know within the United States what the main law is that governs free speech that allows us or gives us the right to free speech? The First Amendment? Yep, First Amendment. And I'm not going to write out what it is, but it's basically like Congress does not have the right to put any sort of laws that prevent you from peacefully organizing and blah, 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 blah. But that's the general gist. So yeah, the First Amendment is the law that we have that governs free speech. And actually, I want to um, change the order of questions three and four. Any questions thus far? All right. Why do we value free speech? What is it that we as people, like if I were to tell you tomorrow we're getting rid of the right to free speech, I think many of you would not like that very much. Why do we like it? What is it that we value about free speech? Or what does the society value about free speech? There's a few different components here, so I want to try to draw out all of them. So yeah, it can help progress in thinking because if you're allowed to say stuff and not be worried about being punished for it, you are going to be able to actually say things that might be controversial, but might allow things to move forward. So to give an example, um, people know the story of Galileo and his house arrest. Do people know this sort of stuff? All right, so who, anyone know who Galileo was? Galileo. Anyone know? All right, so Galileo, yeah, he was, he was a very early scientist and inventor, and he was one of the first people to put, that really put forward this idea 
that the earth went around the sun instead of the sun going around the earth. And that idea ended up having these major implications for science and ideas. Yeah. So he didn't first come up with heliocentric theory, but he was one of the first ones who publicly discussed it. And so what he basically did was he was talking about this. But what happened was the, the idea that the earth goes around the sun contradicted the views of the Catholic Church. So the Pope put him under house arrest. And so he could no longer do his science because he didn't have free speech. But once those sorts of things were not stopped and what scientists can do today is they can try to come up with crazy ideas that go against the conventional views and move things forward. So ideas like the idea that time is relative, whatever that means, that sort of thing is now built into our understanding of um, electronics and other sorts of things that we couldn't have made progress if we weren't able to say these sorts of things. Samson says people like to be heard. And that's another component of it. We like to be able to say what's on our mind. We are a social species that likes to talk and likes to express our views. There's a sense in which being able to say your view is very important to humans' ability to define themselves. So that's another sort of element. So it allows progress. It allows us to express ourselves and grow in this sort of way. Why else do we like it? Another way is what do you lose if you get rid of it? Freedom. Yeah, freedom. It's tied in with freedom and like fear of punishment for saying things. If you live in a world without free speech, you cannot say whatever you want without punishment. You also can't necessarily criticize somebody who is in power. So the, the idea here with free speech is, um, does anyone know if you were in just to give an example, and there's still places in the world where it's like this. If you criticize, just to give an example, I know because I know a lot of history of this time, Middle Ages, if you were in England in say the year 1200, and you said, the king sucks, do you know what would happen to you? Beheaded? Yeah, actually, it would depend on what sort of person you were. If you were a noble person, you'd get beheaded. Um, if you were a commoner, you would be hanged, drawn, and quartered. Do people know what hanging, drawing, and quartering is? If you want to know, I can describe medieval torture to you now. Is it when you get dragged behind a cart? So not quite. It's definitely worse than that. Oh. Um, so basically what hanging, drawing, and quartering is, you first get hung, and right when you're about to die they, and you've suffered, they cut you down, they cut you open, they pull your intestines out, they cook them on a stove in front of you. And then once you're done watching your intestines cook, they chop you into four pieces. That's hanging, drawing, and quartering. Um, yeah, that was what would happen if you said the king sucked in the old days. That had this wonderful fact of people, <laughs> people would not often say things that criticize the king. And so if you thought the king was doing a bad job and you would want the country to be run differently, if you were in a country without freedom of speech, you couldn't say anything. You couldn't improve stuff. So that's why we value free speech. It allows us to live in a society in which if you think the president's doing a bad job and you want them to do better, you can say something without worrying about going to jail. By contrast, there are places in the world where if you're a journalist who criticizes the government, you might be kidnapped, taken to an embassy, and chopped up. That's something which still happens in the world. And that's what we value free speech for. It allows us control to say what we want, to move ideas forward, and for us to just basically not live in fear. However, freedom of speech is not unlimited. There are limits on freedom of speech in any society. So within the context of the United States, there is a right to free speech, but the right to free speech has limits. What are the limits of free speech? So for instance, hate what speech. aren't you allowed to say? Dan. Hate speech. So actually, oh, this no. is something we're gonna Definitely come back to, is hate speech is the dark side. And actually in the United States, hate speech of certain types is not 
prevented by the First Amendment. There are places in which it is illegal, and we'll talk more about that later in class. But generally speaking, things that are just considered straight hate speech are not actually considered illegal. Rather, these include things like defamation. And so what defamation is, is making, and this is related in with libel, these are making things up with the goal of causing someone monetary harm or by destroying their reputation. So if I make up stories about you and put it in the press, that is not allowed according to, um, even though I have freedom of speech, I'm not allowed to do that. It's not protected by the freedom of speech laws of the First Amendment. Also, yes, you cannot make threats. And so this is a um, line between hate speech on the one hand and a thing that is not allowed, which is harm speech. And what harm speech is, is any sort of speech that is going to lead directly to harm of people. And that's why defamation and libel fall under those cases. But harm speech, if I, if I honestly say, so-and-so, I'm gonna come to your house and kill you with my gun, that's not legal, even though, because it's a threat, if you are actually threatened. What are, does anyone know any other examples of harm speech? Yeah, you can't scream fire in a crowded area. You can't walk into a movie th or an airport and yell, oh my God, they've got a gun, because that's going to cause a stampede, which is going to cause harm. So that is also a type of harm speech. Anyone know any others? So here's another one. You couldn't go around passing out. Um, <laughs> uh, you can't go around passing out flyers with instructions on how to make bombs. Um, so like if you were to go to an elementary school and hand children uh, like step-by-step -step instructions on how to make TNT or how to make a hand grenade, that would be illegal because giving children, yeah, or the anarchist cookbook. So yeah, if you go around handing out the anarchist cookbook in a middle school, you're going to get in trouble. If you post online the blueprints to make a nuclear missile, that's considered harm speech. Um, so yeah, you can find these things online, but technically speaking, it's illegal in a lot of cases to read them. But there's also another sense in which free speech is limited. So, <laughs> so another way in which free speech is limited, it's not just that the government uh, can punish you for certain types of things. There are things you're not allowed to say, not because it's illegal, but because you can get punished in other ways. So what are some other things that can limit free speech? So for instance, Right now, there are things I cannot say with it because of what? Like if I were just to start screaming out racial slurs right now, I would get punished for it. But who would punish me? So part of it is social pressure. My job, exactly. Baruch College would fire me if I just started screaming racial slurs. Why? Because free speech only governs what is said by the government. It only controls what the government can punish you for. Private companies are allowed to, in their own context, as long as they aren't discriminating, they are allowed to um, put curbs on what you can and cannot say. So exactly, you represent your company. So a lot of companies now, will have in the code of conduct you have to sign when you join things like, I will not disparage the company on social media. And so if you say, I hate my job, my boss is terrible, and at this company sucks, you can get fired for that. So you can get punished. And that is perfectly legal for a company to do that. If you run around on uh, Baruch campus yelling racial slurs and they say, I'm sorry, you're now expelled. You can't go, but the First Amendment, because the First Amendment only protects you from government rules. This isn't to say that everything that like, there are limits on what a private company can say and not say. So for instance, um, 
a private company isn't allowed to put rules in place that allow them to discriminate against a certain group of people. So there were many cases of people of color not being allowed to rent certain sorts of apartments um, in certain areas. And that was deemed illegal because there was a discriminatory element. But generally speaking, private companies have a lot of power to decide what they can and cannot do. And so don't think that just because generally the First Amendment gives you the right to say things, that therefore there aren't going to be consequences for certain sorts of things. Um, also, something else with this social aspect, another way in which this uh, there are limits is now thanks to cancel culture, which has created another mechanism by which there can be consequences of these things. And so, yes, you might not, it might not be illegal to say something like, um, well, any of the, the various times that somebody gets canceled, the homophobic or transphobic or something that an author says, or that a um, comedian says, or that a musician says, those sorts of things, they're not illegal, but if you say something offensive enough, uh, you will get canceled and nobody will listen to your music or do anything like that. So there are limits to free speech. Um, and there are limits to what you can do, even if technically speaking, it is legally allowed to do that sort of thing. So everyone on board so far with what free speech is, how it works, blah, 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 blah. We good? All right. So then, that means we're done. One, two, four, three. What then is the dark side of free speech? Um, it's not actually the Sith. The Sith are um, somewhat problematic. Uh, but they actually don't allow for free speech. So therefore, they're not really the dark side of free speech. They're the dark side that shuts down free speech. Um, so what is the dark side of free speech? Yeah, hate speech. What is hate speech? What is the de Does anyone know what the definition of hate speech is? So racism is one example of it. You can either give me examples or def So abusive speech, it depends on the type of abusive speech because some type of abusive speech gets deemed harm speech. So if it's abusive in a threatening sense, then it can fall into the harm speech category. But hate speech generally are cases in which you're saying hateful things that aren't actually causing harm or threat. So these are going to include racist remarks, sexist remarks, homophobic remarks. Um, and generally speaking, the way it's defined is that what hate speech is, is speech that is designed to insult people because of their membership in some group. So racist speech counts because what you're doing is saying something like, this person is bad and they're bad simply because they're a member of a certain race, or this person is bad simply because they're a certain gender. This person is bad because they are a member of a certain religion. So the idea with hate speech is it's not just hateful things said to people of a certain group. It's hateful things that are said to members of a group because they are members of that group. So these are gonna include things like racial slurs. These are going to include things like statements like people of a certain group are savages or people of a certain group are lesser or people of a certain group aren't fully human. Those are all cases of hate speech. Any other examples, either that you've seen personally or that you've uh, heard in the news or anything like that? No, um, fake, fake news and misinformation. Yeah, so some cases of fake news and misinformation are gonna count as hate speech. So if it's the sort of thing where, so not all fake news is gonna count as hate speech because you can have a fake news story that's something like um, Hillary Clinton is running a child pedophile ring out of a basement. Um, that's not hate speech because it's not saying she's terrible because of she's a woman or something like that. But a lot of fake news like, people of X race are violent or people of this religion, um, you can't trust them because they are gonna 
steal from you or something like that. That's all going to be hate speech where you're um, spreading or like people this just in, people of this group scored 75% lower on IQ tests, which is a made up fake news story I just made up. So that would be a, another example. Also, um, well, does anyone have any other examples they want to share? You can think of a lot from during the pandemic. Yeah, so sexism and misogyny are going to count as long as it's the sort of thing. So if somebody says like, um, so-and-so can't do this because they're gender blah, then it's going to count. Or like people of this gender are just bad at math or something like that. That would count as hate speech. Or like being dismissive of someone because of this disabled. Yeah, any sort of hatred against um, people who are not fully abled is another sort of case of hate speech. Also, all the, and it doesn't, again, have to be speech. So, oh, ageism is another one where you um, discriminate or say hateful things about, against the old. Um, but another type of hate speech was, remember early on in the pandemic when there were all those stories of people just walking up to Asian people and coughing on them and saying, you brought COVID. Those are cases of hate speech. Um, those are all cases, or if you t say to someone, um, you're not welcome here because uh, you're blank. Like, that's all hate speech. So yeah, a, a case of uh, your Vietnamese friend getting called nasty words in Virginia, that is hate speech. Um, and this is actually an interesting case because the line between hate speech and harm speech is a little blurry in a case when the person saying the hate speech is holding a gun. Um, and I think this is something that I want to talk about more, is this line between hate and harm. And especially, well, just does everyone have the grasp of what hate speech is? You can either thumb up or yes, yes or type in chat. I just want to make sure we're all on board. All right. So everyone know what hate speech is? We're good. All right. Um, so then why, like, just to give you a, like, point of discussion, like 20 years ago, hate speech was not being discussed to the same degree that it is today. Like, it's always been a thing. It's always been around, but it wasn't discussed in the same way. And it wasn't as big of a talking point. Things have shifted in the past 20 years to a certain extent. What has been the driving force behind this change? So Kaz says, stupider people have a voice now. And why do they have a voice? What has given them that voice? Social media. Exactly, Avendee. Social media and the internet have fundamentally changed our relationship with hate speech. And so what exactly? So I'm going to race one through five. And we can actually work through here. So what is it that has changed the nature of hate speech? What is it about the internet and social media? Well, one thing is just that, what is it about the fact that we have a platform? So one is anonymity. Anonymity. What the is amount it? of people that you could reach out to? Say that again, Carmen. Uh, the amount of people that you could reach yes. out to on social media wider reach. So I'm just going to put up these ones right now um, and then we can work through them. Does anyone else have anything to throw up here quickly before I go back and talk about these two? All right, so let's talk about anonymity then. What do we mean by anonymity? No one knows who you are. Yeah, yeah. no one knows who you are. Or Honestly, it's less about not knowing who you are and as long as you feel like no one knows who you are. And this is an interesting thing where even if in truth, someone could figure out who you are, as long as you don't think anyone can, you will behave in a more aggressive manner. And this is just a matter of, they've done a lot of studies on this. You put a bunch of people into a crowd and put masks on them, they're gonna act more violently simply because they don't think they can be identified. And what does the internet give you? Well, if I walk up to your face and say a racial slur to you, it's very different than if like surferboy44 at, AI, at AIM.com posts online, like racial slur at you, racial slur at you. Why? Because when you're far away, 
you don't think that there are consequences, but there's another aspect of it. Why else is it that being online and being anonymous allows people to say things and racial things and more hate speech? How many yeah, of you think, wrong. oh wait, say that again, Carmen. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but more confidence in being able to. That's exactly it. How many of you think that, think of the person you hate the most. How many of you think you could walk up to them face to face and say the meanest thing you could and watch them break down in tears? Versus how many of you, like if you can, you are a stronger person as I can and, that, and than I am. But <laughs> Jesus, Kaz. <laughs> but um, <laughs> sorry, you just bored me with that. Um, but most people are much more able to say horrible things if they don't see the consequences of their actions because we as a social creature are literally programmed to respond to human faces and human emotions. And if we respond to faces and emotions, we it's much easier if you don't have to see the face of someone who's hurt or harmed. So if you make someone sad and never see it, you're far more likely to be willing to say the hateful thing. Also, if you're doing it online, you think no one can punish you for it. And a lot of cases, they won't be able to because they won't put in the effort to know who you are. The second thing, much wider reach. So let's say it's the year, um, so the year's one. In the year, and we'll say uh, CE. So the year one CE. Most people in the year one CE were illiterate. They could not read or write. So most people in this year, how far could they reach out? How many people could, if I wanted to say something hateful, how many people would be the most that could see me or hear me or get my content? Karin. Um. What's going to control if I'm illiterate, everyone around me is illiterate, and I want to say something hateful, what's what's going to determine the maximum number of people that can come into contact with my hateful speech? Say that again. Oh, so it's going to be my own oh, community, but it's not just going to be my own community, because not my entire community is going to be able to know what I'm saying. Who's actually going to be able to? What is the determining factor? Yourself. Yeah, it's it's myself. And basically, as Nikki said, who can hear me? It's literally how far can I project my voice? If you're 100 feet away and I start screaming racial slurs, you might not hear me. The maximum number of people are going to be the people in my direct vicinity. Nowadays, if I start typing racial slurs on Twitter, who can see it? Everyone. Everybody who's on Twitter. And, well, yeah, not Trump because he's off Twitter. But generally speaking, worldwide, anybody can see this. So there's much wider reach. And this has two factors. Because there's much wider reach, one, there's going to be more hateful stuff that could come to you. And also on the flip side, any hateful stuff you say will reach more people. So just the amount of hateful things a person comes into contact with every day is going to go up. And what's the consequence of that? Well, a lot more psychological harm and stress is going to be caused than in the past. So that's another major issue around this. What are some other ways in which the internet has changed these things? Think about it this way. It's a hundred years ago. Okay, so another thing has this is the speed of information. So yeah, that ties in. So it's not just much wider reach. As soon as you say something, it will spread. So because it's all spreading so quickly, that's also gonna increase speed of info. So just it's not just more and wider spread, more stuff is going to be getting said. So there's just more slurs, more hateful stuff being said. But here's another big component of it. Um, 50 years ago, what was the number one determiner of who you interacted with the most and who you talked to the most? 
Where you lived. Where you lived, exactly. It was difficult for you to interact with people who were not physically around you. Nowadays, what's the number one factor determining what types of people we talk to? Status. Your followers on Instagram. But yeah, it's basically your interests because who, what determines who you follow on Instagram? If you find out that I follow like 47 makeup bloggers, what do you know about me? <laughs> You're a like, creep. <laughs> that I, I really like makeup or I find this. Yeah, these are the sorts of things I you learn about me or you find out. Yeah, just so another major difference is people gather by interests. And why does that matter? Not necessarily, Omar. Um, I have, some of these people are very, very talented. I watch a lot of makeup bloggers. Um, they're actually incredibly talented people. But yeah, so people gather by their interests. And in these sorts of cases, why does that matter? Why is it that gathering by interests matter? Well, how many of you have heard of, um, yeah, let's not say anything uh, derogatory in the chat or um, stereotyping or anything like that. Yeah. Um, confirmation bias. What is, how many of you have heard of confirmation bias? If you're looking for it, you'll find it. Yeah, exactly. It's what it is, is you are more likely to find information that confirms what you already believe. So if you are, if you already believe that um, somebody's very talented, then you're more likely to see what they're doing as good. If you think someone has no talent, you're far more likely to identify their flaws or their problems. Um, so everyone understand what confirmation bias is. And now, why is confirmation bias matter? Well, what ends up happening is if you are having people gathered together by their interests and there's confirmation bias tied in with that, then what's gonna happen is what is called group polarization. So how many of you have heard the phrase group polarization? Yeah, echo chamber, or you lead to a bunch of incels. Um, so what is group polarization? Well, what is it to polarize? What is a pole? So where is the North Pole? Probably the opposite, the top. Yeah, it's not just up there, it's the tippy top. And the South Pole is the tippy bottom. So what the poles are, are the most extreme positions. And what group polarization is, is a tendency of members of groups to adopt more extreme positions by interacting with other members who share their views. So to give a practical case, imagine you've got five people who are, yeah, so people, incels is a good case. So imagine you've got five people who believe that, somewhat believe that all the world's problems are caused by women and everything that bad has ever happened to them, they're open to the idea that everything that's ever caused them problems is caused by women. And now imagine these five people. So they, at the beginning, they're like, yeah, I think that might be right, but I'm not sure. Now imagine for a week, the only people they talk to are other people who believe that all the problems in the world are quite possibly caused by women. At the end of the week, are they gonna believe more or less strongly that indeed all the world's problems and their problems in particular are caused by women? Is it gonna be strong? Yeah, more strongly. And why? Why is that gonna be more strong? They're focusing on. Yeah, and also, if they're only talking to other people, it's being confirmed because that's the only information they're getting. And this is the echo chamber idea. This is the idea that the only things they're gonna be hearing, if you're only talking to other people who are somewhat biased, 
you are over time only going to be hearing more arguments for why this particular view is right. So over time, you'll be getting more and more and more extreme. This is the same sort of thing with white supremacy. You put five people who kind of think white people are the best into a chat room together, have them talk for a month, and a month into it, all they're going to be hearing are reasons to think white people are the best. And by the end, they will be drawing stronger conclusions and feel more strongly about white nationalism. And so that's another issue with the internet, because why has the internet allowed for this? Well, why can you now find people based on your interests? Well, because all the interests you could want are out there on the internet. If you're interested in sports, if you're interested in sneakers, if you're interested in white supremacy, you can find other people who are going to allow you to come together and hold these more extreme sorts of views. So does everyone understand that sort of idea of how something like hate speech, which generally when you're just talking in a room of other people of diverse backgrounds will cause some immediate harm it's not going to lead to this overall polarization in the way that it can on the internet where white supremacists are just talking to other white supremacists or incels are talking to incels. Um, so, <laughs> Omar, <laughs> no, the war started because um, Menelaus was a fucking jealous dick and his brother was also a jealous dick who had too much honor. So it wasn't really her fault. It was the fact that they were controlling. Um, and yes, Agamemnon wanted to fight anyway. But um, so yes, <laughs> uh, that's enough um, Greek mythology though. Although it's, <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, men need to toughen up is what the answer is. Men are, men are thin-skinned and exactly, as Dan put it, dumb men thinking with their wieners cause wars or dumb men thinking with their pride cause wars. Um, all right, back to group polarization. Um, everyone on board with what group polarization is? Everyone understand how this is caused more and more by the, uh, by the internet and all of, these sorts of things. Yes. All right, can I get some thumbs from other people? Are people still alive at the other end? Testing, I'm testing, glad. testing. All right, awesome. Um, and so confirmation bias, group polarization. All right, what are other reasons that the internet is leading to these problems? What are other ways in which the internet has made hate speech worse? Or another way of putting this is what is something that's true of the internet that can lead to problems? So here's one thing, it means we avoid human contact. And what is one downside of avoiding human contact? So let's go with an example right now. Right now in the chat, if I were to type something, can you necessarily tell whether I'm joking or not? No, you can't tell necessarily if I'm joking. There's no context, no tone. And so because of this, what can happen? Well, there can be more miscommunication than ever before. And in particular, um, yeah, so right now you can tell, but if I were to type in the chat something like blah, 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 people of this are blank. Um, can you tell I'm joking? Can you tell I'm not? Is it going to be hate speech? Is it not going to be hate speech? So that's another reason in which the internet has changed is no context in communication. And I think this has two consequences. One is because if there's no context in communication, things that are meant as a joke might actually be hateful speech without a person meaning to because they're just ignorant and not taking into account how other people might feel. But here's another issue, which goes back to uh, Dan's point before about if I tell somebody that something, like if I say you are a person of this race and you don't belong here, and I say it while holding a gun, is that hate speech or harm speech? Harm speech. Yeah, it seems like it might be harm speech. 
Um, Carmen. No, never mind. I said both, but yeah, so I mean, what, I guess more no, keep going. I cut you off. That was my fault. No, that's okay. I just think I thought it was both, but I guess it is more harmful. But um, so the the question though is, I think a lot of you are saying harm speech, but it's not all that clear cut. Like if you were to ask the guy who's just standing there with the gun. All he's going to say is, I'm not threatening you. I just happen to be holding a gun and it's my right. Exactly. Sort of. It's sort of harm speech and sort of hate speech. And the line between it is blurry. And I think, Cass, isn't it battery? I think it depends on the state and I think it depends on the laws. Um, because like whether it's a threat or not, because there are like in states in which, um, yeah, assault is the threat of violence. So it depends entirely on the state. So for instance, in a state in which conceal and carry laws are allowed, and that's one where you can carry a gun around on you or um, exposed concealing or exposed carry is allowed. So you're allowed to carry a gun as long as it's visible. Um, in that sort of state, it's going to be a different bar for whether it counts as a threat or not. Because if you just spend most of your time with a gun on you, then it's not gonna be the sort of case where if it's illegal to have a gun and you have one in your hand, it might be a different sort of thing. So no context matters. Be, or um, There's this line that's somewhat unclear between hate speech and harm speech. And why this matters is the line between them becomes even more blurry when you go online. So for instance, um, to go with an actual hateful, harmful thing, rape threats on the internet that are done in like chats. So, you know, the comment section, a female writer writes something that somebody doesn't like. And then in the chat, there's a comment of me and my friends are going to rape you. That sort of case is, is that a threat or is it not a threat? It's very, yeah, those are the worst kinds of people. But legally speaking, like, I think we all agree it's morally wrong. But should we consider it harm speech that in the United States you can go to jail for? Or is it just hate speech? It's really unclear in an online context, especially if you're somebody who's sending this online message from a different country or from a different state. And yes, this is a horrible thing to say and in no way condoning it. But how do you judge it from a legal standpoint? And another sort of case is um, the line that, so another thing that's deemed harm speech is a call to arms. So for instance, if I say people of this race are bad and therefore we shouldn't give them jobs, that's not considered harm speech. But if I say something like people of this race are bad, therefore gather your guns and pitchforks and go kill them, that's a call to arms and that's harm speech. But in an online context, is something a call to arms or is something just hateful speech? And Dan brings up the classic case of this, the assault on the Capitol, exactly. When Trump was saying, go talk to your politicians, was he calling for violence or not? It's unclear because he says one thing, other people say something else. But it would have been even more unclear, and I think part of the reason the unclarity was there is because a lot of this was being said on Twitter. Was he kidding? How responsible is he for that? So if you are typing something on Twitter and you say this sort of like everyone gather up and let's like fight for white supremacy, is that a call to arms or is that just hate speech? It's really unclear. And this can have actual consequences because you may have intended it as just hateful speech, but does the fact that you intended it as hateful speech prevent anyone from thinking it's a call to arms? If I think I'm just saying something hateful, but you think I'm saying real white supremacists gather and don't kill people of color, and you thought I was saying that's right, you might take that as harm speech and do something about it. So to give actual cases, 
what um, within the past few years, there've been a lot of cases of mass shootings at religious organizations, be they mosques or churches or synagogues. And very often the person who commits the shooting, what is learned about that person afterwards? So oftentimes it's their religion, but yeah, what Dan said, they posted hatred online and very often they engaged in these communities where other people were saying things like, this race is terrible and deserves to die. So someone took that, internalized it and went on a killing rampage. Does that mean the person who posted this just hateful thing? Back in the day, it would have been much clearer that this person was not calling others to arms. But because there's this level of miscommunication, what ends up happening is there's now what used to just be hate speech can more easily be turned into harm speech. You can have cases where someone who gets so upset ends up grabbing a gun and shooting large numbers of people because they think that there's a group of people who supports that sort of behavior and is saying that somebody with their views should do that sort of thing. So that's another reason that hate speech has become more and more problematic. So does everyone understand how it's not that hate speech is a new thing? Hate speech has been around forever. It's just that the internet has fundamentally made it a bigger problem than it was. When was the First Amendment written? Anyone know approximately? If you know the actual year, great, I don't. But anyone know approximately? Yeah, 1780 something or other. Yeah, you know what they didn't have in 1780 something or other? They didn't even have phones yet. They didn't have te telegraphs yet. It was writing letters. So we have this law that was designed to control hate speech or that basically hate speech couldn't become as much of a problem back then. However, nowadays, with new technology, we're still using the same laws. And we now have this ethical dilemma. Because I think for most of American history, we were fine with the First Amendment governing these things. Nowadays, there's this question of, is it timeless? Is the First Amendment still the best way of doing things? Or is it outdated because of modern technology? Does the fact that now hate speech, and I, oh, there's one other reason that I think this is worth mentioning, and this has less to do with the internet. Um, what is something that now people seem to care about a lot more than 10 years ago? Mental health. Mental health is becoming more and more discussed. It used to be that if you weren't physically causing the harms to someone, it wasn't harm. Nowadays, we understand this special type of mental harm. So the line between hate speech and harm speech, like if you have a thousand people using the N-word at you online and telling you you deserve to die, then is that really just hate speech? Or is that beginning to become harm speech, especially as there's become more and more cases of people who have been subjected to things like cyberbullying, going and committing suicide. So this line as well of between hate and harm as we get a better understanding of mental distress and mental harm is becoming this new thing of this problem that we didn't used to have before. And so we are in this time where basically we have to ask ourselves this practical ethical question, which is to what degree of free speech do we want? And in the United States, there very much is a romanticization of the First Amendment. And I think it's worth asking, is that something that we should continue to support to the same degree? And I don't think the answer is clear because on the one hand, First Amendment is valuable. Well, as we talked about, free speech is crucial to a well-functioning society. But on the other hand, how much free speech do you want? And what we actually find these days is different countries have different answers to this question. So it's not like every country has the same answer to how much free speech is the right amount of free speech. So we can imagine this kind of chart from complete freedom of speech um, so I guess that is another point is if you take away free speech, how will you know who the hateful ones are? That's actually a really good point. And I've never actually thought about that. 
is there actually value in the fact that if you're allowed to say hateful things, you are warning people that you are hateful? And I think that actually that's a, like an interesting utilitarian question of does the fact that you are now signaling your hate to others who can now avoid you, how much overall good does that compare to the polarization and the problems? Yeah, that's an amazing point. I've never really thought of that, Nikki. Um, you push them into the darker corners where you can't watch them conspiring against others. Yeah, and, but I think the worry is, so I think that that's one side of it. And I think you're right. If you take it away, then they can, um, you can't do that. But on the other hand, uh, you have this issue of, does the ability of people to talk about this in the open um, allow you to, what ends up happening is not that you now know who the hateful ones are, but you know who the hateful ones are and they multiply and there's more hate. And so you might think like, yes, I can now identify who the racists are, but now there's 30 times as many as there used to be. And maybe you, you're going to have to weigh which is better, which is worse. And I don't think that there's a clear answer to this because that's a really awesome point. But generally speaking, you can think of a nation as somewhere on this um, scale from complete free speech. So this would be a society which has never existed. And in this society, you're allowed to basically say whatever you want. You can yell, oh my God, there's, they've got a bomb in an airport. You can do anything, like complete anarchy. On the other end, you can imagine a science fiction world where you couldn't even think, like somebody controlled your thoughts. So it's not even that you can't say things, it's that you can't even think what is uh, thoughts that, oops, I just went blurry. Give me one second. Yeah. Sometimes I move my arms too much and then the screen gets blurry. All right, yeah, I look clear again. Um, so at this end, you have like complete control. So the question then is, yeah, Brave New World. Um, oh, I didn't know that it was on acid. That's a good thing to know. Um, yeah, 1984, these sorts of things. Um, where then is the correct place to draw the line? So as a matter of fact, where would you, like, and different societies come up with different answers. Some have much more value over control of the society. So there are countries in which free speech is greatly controlled. So like an extreme example would be somewhere like North Korea, where you cannot say things. So like North Korea is closer to the complete control end. And then the US is all the way over here, much more in the complete free speech. It's not universal, but there's more and more. Um, and then there are though countries that are in between and are answering this question differently from us. So yes, yeah, Saudi Arabia is another country where I'm not sure if it's quite as far as North Korea, but it's somewhere over here. China is also gonna be somewhat more on this side. Russia is gonna be more over here. The U.S. is about as far of actual countries this direction as you can get. Anyone know who I'm, what sorts of countries I'm putting here in this kind of closer to the U.S. but not quite all the way there camp? So yeah, Germany is a very good example of this. Generally speaking, um, basically Western European nations who actively went through the Holocaust or the Nazi control. So places like Germany, and France. So do people know what the actual differences are between the laws in France and Germany and the United States? What are things we're allowed to do that they cannot? So here's one example, just to give one. If I wanted to open up a, uh, I wanted to open up a flag shop, like a little stand over by Baruch's campus and the only flags I sold were swastika Third Reich flags. Would I be allowed to do that as long as I was off Baruch's campus and had a permit? Could I sell? Yeah, I could as long as I'm not doing it in a way, as long as I got the permit. Um, oh, you wouldn't let me, okay. In Germany, I would never be allowed to do that. And in such a way, you can't even sell like old Nazi war memorabilia on French internet. You can't uh, post any sort of neo-Nazi things on German Twitter. And if you do, Twitter will actually 
Twitter has 10 minutes to take down your post or Twitter will be fined. So um, this sort of case is the sort of one of like, well, what are the benefits of having a society like this? What are the benefits of having a society in which you control hate speech? Well, the benefits are there's less hate speech and less people having their um, having to go through this mental turmoil. There's going to be less sort of uh, online um, polarization. But on the other hand, there are certain sorts of things like where do you draw the line between controlling hate speech and controlling cultural expression? Because a nation like France not only doesn't allow things like Nazi propaganda, they also don't allow certain types of religious clothing and things like that because that's deemed potentially hateful. And so the lines get really blurry and there's this big question of where's the correct place to draw the line. Um, and so we could spend the rest of class just discussing where's the right place to draw the line. And if anyone wants to put forward their views on where the right place to draw the line is, feel free to speak up now. Uh, if, however, you want some time to die, this is something that you're, uh, oh, Jesus. Uh, this is something you want to think over or noodle over and write a paper on. One of the topics for the final paper is, imagine somebody starts a neo-Nazi website with a blog component and a selling component, if you could control the laws, where should this be allowed or should it not be allowed? And so I think there's a lot to think of here in which like, and the reason why this question is coming up is because of the internet and because of the way the internet has changed the nature of free speech, the nature of hate speech. Does anyone have any questions on the content stuff of today? We're all good. Say you're good or give me a thumbs up or wave or um, anything. Okay. Um, that's actually a really good question, Omar. I'd have to think that one. It's worse to say you're going to murder someone or tell them to kill themselves. And actually, a case where it's like, my gut feeling is almost like it's worse to tell someone to but only one of these is going to be deemed illegal. Uh, and it's not the one that I think is necessarily worse. Yeah, and that guy bullied, uh, the girl that bullied her boyfriend into killing himself and then went to jail, to killing that girl who bullied, was bullied? I'm confused by your by the pronouns. Um, somebody bullied somebody else and somebody killed themselves. Yeah, that's the sort of case in which she bullied her boyfriend into killing himself. Okay. Um, there was also the case of the mom who catfished and pretended to be a teen girl and bullied someone to the point that that teen girl killed herself. Um, that was another really screwed up case. Um, but so I think this is something that's worth thinking about more because I don't think there are clear answers. And it is a real ethical dilemma that comes up. And you can really think about it using some of the things we've talked about earlier in the semester. You can come up with things like, what would a utilitarian say? the correct place to draw the line is? What would a deontologist say? Would a cultural relativist say that the correct place to draw the line is going to be determined by the culture? But on top of, a problem with that is the internet has fundamentally changed what counts as your culture. If I in the US can talk to people in Germany online, then where do you draw the lines for cultural relativism? Can you say that the right answer to free speech is different based on the culture? What becomes really hard to define what the culture is. All right, I am tired of hearing my own voice. Um, here's a question. Uh, how many of you are, are deeply ready for spring break? How many of you would say that your brain is still working? Is anyone's brain still working? All right, um, so I made this dumb mistake where... Uh, I assigned a reading for the class before spring break that's rather like complicated and a topic that I don't know if I have the brain power to present in a clear way. It's an interesting topic, but to be perfectly honest, I think it's something that's better for after spring break. So what I think I'm gonna do is just, um, so as of right now, the last class is lined up to just be a day in which I say, any questions on your papers go away. Um, 
However, what I'm thinking about doing is the reading, which we were supposed to do tomorrow, or I mean Thursday, I'm going to make it an optional thing to read for the last day of class. So here's what's going to happen. We're going to have the same number of classes for those of you who want to, and same amount of information. It's just the last class is now going to become an optional class in which we discuss this epistemic bubbles and echo chambers reading, if you want to talk about it. And in the meantime, Thursday, I'm just like, I don't feel like subjecting you all to a class that is going to be crap. But I want to make sure that if you're interested in this stuff, you have the opportunity to learn it. So here's the long winded way of saying, if anyone wouldn't object, I'm going to vote that we cancel class on Thursday and cover the stuff that we're going to cover on Thursday on the last day of the semester if you want to. Otherwise, you can just go home on the last day of the semester. I just don't want anyone who wants their full money's worth to not get their full money's worth. But if nobody objects, my vote would be rather than trying to cover something that is going to be complicated, we're going to be half out of just to cancel class Thursday, officially end your start your philosophy spring break as of today and go ahead and worry about this reading about epistemic bubbles and echo chambers some point later in the semester. Is there anyone who greatly objects to this plan? Anyone at all? All right, so everyone's on board with canceling class Thursday and then covering the stuff on the last class optionally. Everyone is good with this. We're all good with it. Can I get some thumbs? I don't want to like cancel class on people if they're not. Um... All right, just wanted to make sure. All right, in that case, I'm going to officially cancel class Thursday and I will email everyone about it. So basically you have nothing to do for philosophy until after the break. There will be a reading. It's going, we're just gonna follow along the syllabus as it is just skipping the echo chambers and epistemic bubbles week till the very end. And then that'll even be optional. So yes, no class Thursday, take your Thursday, rest up, get yourself your spring break time. Don't worry about having to take the subway uh, with chaos still going on. All right, so I'm gonna stop the recording.